uh, we only had like one session where it was overlapped, but uh, Scott Murphy uh, does, he's a, a Wizards of the Coast artist, does lots of work for them. And I, I walked up to him like my first summer there, it's like my second week and he was painting and it was, he was actually painting a piece for Wizards of the Coast at the time. And I sat down and I was like, so I want your job. How, <laughs> how do I get your job? Yeah. And he was so cool. He like put his painting aside. I didn't realize it, but he had like a deadline like the next day, but he like put his painting aside and he turned around. He's like, so you're interested in tabletop games. And he gave me so much advice. What is it like being a freelance artist in the tabletop gaming industry? Well, I sat down with Alyssa Menold and we found that out. She is responsible for some of my favorite artwork ever produced for weird games. Remember the Molly box? How about the Easter Vix? How about all the faction banners that we got in an M3E? Those are all from Alyssa, plus a lot more. We dig into her process, how she goes from concept to finished product. What's it like to work with different clients? And we pull back the curtain on creating some of my favorite artwork in the industry. Enjoy. Third Floor Wars delivers interviews, insights, and discussions about everything hitting the tabletop. Screens turned off, phones put away, and friends gathered around a table. In a world where life hits you from all sides, you deserve time to relax, disconnect, and unplug. Rule books, plastic models, dice, and cards in hand. Let the gaming begin. Tabletop games let you escape and unleash grand battles and regale epic tales of adventure with your friends. If you love gaming and learning from players, designers, experts, and creators, you are in the right place. Pull up a chair. Craig and Ray welcome you to the third floor and the Tabletop Talk Podcast. Craig here on the third floor. Today we're talking to Alyssa Menold, a freelance illustrator. Her work is everywhere. Now, Malifaux fans, and I know you're out there, you know her work with Weird. Now, get this. She's done the art for the Pirate Molly Box, the Easter Vix, the Alt Raspy set, all of the new faction banners, and the cover for the Through the Breach of City and Gate campaign. Um, it's a little overwhelming. And before I realized this was all the same person, I kept seeing some great art and then came across Alyssa on Twitter and started connecting the dots. And I was like, holy cow. So Alyssa, welcome to the third floor. Hi, it's good to be here. So Alyssa, normally, not normally, but a lot of my guests are gamers because uh, this is a primary Malifaux po podcast. So we talk about a lot of other games. We do a lot of these insider insights. Yeah. So typically what I ask people because they're, I know they're gamers is uh, how did they get into gaming? So my first question is, do you play games? I sure do. What do you like to play? I, well, I like d and I feel like that's the classic. Uh, everyone's got to start there. Um, I yeah. really like D&D. &D. I like a lot of role-playing games. I like Numenera as well as the nice. recent one I've gotten really into. Um, I also like a lot of board games. Um, I think the my intro into the RPG world was uh, suddenly I'm blanking on the name. It's the plaid hat game with the mice. Do you oh, know which one I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about and now I can't think of it. Um, like it's sitting, it's sitting just in the other room on a shelf, and then suddenly, oh, I can't think of it. I can't think of it. I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So that that was your first introduction into role playing. Yeah, because my husband had has been playing D and D for a long time, and all all my college friends would play it, and like he tried to explain it to me multiple times, and I was like, "But where's the board?" <laughs> he's like, "It's in your imagination." I was like, "So do you have like cards?" <laughs> And he's like, no, no, it's 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 in your brain. I was like, okay, so you like imagine the board. Like I couldn't, <laughs> I could not understand. Oh, Mice and Mystics, that's that's the that's name of the it. board game. Very yeah. good. Yep, that's it. And it wasn't until a, a college friend brought over Mice and Mystics to uh, just a general board game uh, style night that I actually, I was like, he was like, okay, it's like this, but take away take away the board and you're just playing the characters and you've got distance instead of actual squares and that was when it finally clicked and i got super into it like with most things our spy our spouses explain something to us and we just can't get it through our thick heads and then somebody comes somebody who's not our spouse says it to us and you're like oh yeah that makes total yeah. sense why didn't you say that to start off with you see my husband like face palming in the distance exactly yeah <laughs> um so now let's talk about board games then so yeah. what kind of board games are you, do you enjoy um, I 
tend to like the more casual board game. I'm trying to think my recent haul from uh, Gen Con, not obviously this last year. <laughs> not that uh, recent. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> the year before, um, I got like Bunny Kingdom. I got Sinister mm. Six. Um, uh, what else? Just uh, general general board games like that. Um, uh, I really... Oh, my... <laughs> Claire, sorry, my talk's doing her own thing back there. That's fine. Um, I can't hear her, so she's fine. Okay, good, good. Well, I, I won't say anything next time she starts acting up. <laughs> um, but there's Arc the uh, oh, Arcane Wonders has this uh, mage game I really like too. I'm I like suddenly that. I'm blanking on I'm blanking on all. <laughs> that's all right. Mage well, Wars. Another... That's the one. Mage Wars. Oh, I really like. Is, mage and Wars. that's good. I, I really enjoyed it. It wasn't until I started playing Malifaux that I realized Mage Wars in a lot of ways is kind of like, just like Mice and Mystics was my intro into the role-playing world. I feel like uh, Mage Wars is kind of my intro into the miniatures world. Right. Like it's it's the same principle, I feel like, as a lot of war games. It's just um, simplified movement. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so now that leads me to Malifaux then. So yeah. you have actually played Malifaux? I didn't start playing Malifaux until I actually started working for the company and I uh -huh. moved down to Atlanta, Georgia and uh, there's this you know, awesome local game store called Gigabytes. And oh, it's one of my favorite stores yeah. in the country. It's an amazing I, I, store. I miss it so much. It's yeah. like the main thing I miss from Georgia is Gigabytes. And uh, there's some a lot of really awesome, cool people hanging out there and they showed me the ropes and helped me buy my first set and... Like you could, I could get it through the company, but I'd have to wait. So I was like, I can't wait. I can't wait. So I just bought a set there. And, um, and then they like had to explain assembling them to me, which yeah. I, I had never assembled miniatures. And I'm, I'm so glad I had to assemble them because it changed the way I designed them because I was like, oh my God, these small parts are the Isn't worst. Isn't that funny? I wouldn't have thought of that. Sure. And and especially like seeing the tiny parts, like when I just come in from a pure painting point, I'd never thought of the mechanical aspect of how, yeah. how you pour you poor souls who actually have to clip those out of the sprues and, <laughs> and glue them. I, I'd never thought of that. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't design so many small parts. That's really funny. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> there's, and there's I people... actually, actually had to do it myself and I'd drop a piece in the carpet and just be like, oh, my God, why was that so small? So for you listening now, whenever you guys are putting together models and that little uh, that little ear that was on the sprue flies <laughs> off, the, the, the call will be, Alyssa! <laughs> so I guess my next question then is, have you actually, like with a brush, painted models? I have a little bit. Um, and I, I feel like I went into it maybe a little bit arrogantly. I was I like, oh, did. well, I have painted the characters this will be so easy and that lasted about 30 seconds and yeah. you know i'm sitting there with that tiny little paintbrush and i'm just like screaming and i'm like how do you paint the eyeballs they're so small <laughs> how does anyone do this yeah um i do not have the patience my minis look terrible they're so hard the, the people who do it like i was watching some of the other people at gigabyte um paint and i'm just in complete awe of of your guys's patience and level of skill <laughs> to get that small, like on the computer when I'm painting those characters, I blow them up. Like they're you huge. Right in. <laughs> I, I, I've never, I don't have to go in there with a tiny brush ever. It's it's a whole different skill. Well, and I would imagine, obviously, we're going to get into it a lot. I, I imagine this is true with what you do as well. As so much of it is technique uh, mm -hmm. versus talent, you know, and yeah, and talent's a part of it. I mean, there's talented painters, you know, many many painters out there. I'm not one of them, though. I enjoy painting miniatures, um, but so much of it's technique, and and a lot of people, you know, they get frustrated or or they use that as a blocker. So they say, I I, I don't have enough talent to paint minis, and I'm like, shut up, you're wrong, <laughs> because it, it literally it's ninety yeah. percent practice and technique. Um, um, which yeah, I find, I've, go ahead. Oh no, I, I'm a hundred percent in agreement. Um, I, I don't, I'm not, it's, it's really interesting. You bring that up. I, I think that's always interesting to talk about artists and see where, like, it, that's always like, to me, that one of the most interesting questions to ask artists is like, how much do you believe in talent? And mm -hmm. you get a whole bunch of different answers. I am not a big believer in talent. Um, I, but you and I are on the same yeah, page. Yeah. It, and it, it's, and there are qualities that a person can have innately that help a lot. Um, yep. I think in the same way that if you saw an amazing neurosurgeon, you'd be like, well, maybe they have really dexterous hands or maybe mm -hmm. they have um, 
a, a really great memory for learning all these medical facts, but you wouldn't call it a talent that they were born with. Like surgery isn't a talent. It's a skill that they built up. And I, I think art, art's the same way. Like you might have a natural inclination to to uh, to to visual uh, problem solving, but the actual process of applying paint to the canvas, of learning how to compose, of figuring out uh, in miniatures, like you have a whole different set of issues to deal with of how to make this this three D. Like especially when I see you guys do like light sources mm-hmm. on the mini. Like oh my god, my mind's blown when you guys see that. <laughs> it's, it's easier in a painting, but it's it, like that that all that stuff is is learned. It is. And it's, and it's because it's familiar, right? It's from the way you deal with light, Mm -hmm. you're very familiar with, and you've practiced it and honed that craft over time. Mm -hmm. And on a miniature, when I'm painting a miniature, I'm still dealing with light. I mean, it's not that different, right? It's still, still understanding light and understanding how light interacts with surfaces and, and, and things like that. But that's all technique. That's all learned. And, um, you know, sometimes I'll post, you know, post my minis up and, I'm going to say this and I, and, and it, it's going to sound weird and hopefully I'll be able to talk myself <laughs> out of it after I ex- say it, but somebody will go, God, Craig, you're so talented. And I mean, it's a very nice thing to say. Right. And I'm sure you get this a ton yeah. too. Uh, I think I've said it to you. <laughs> um, and, um, but there's a part of me that goes, yeah, but you know, it's also a shit ton of work. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and like, I've spent a lot of time, getting to the point where I can paint a model the way I do. And there's people that paint much better than I do. And they've put in just more work than I have. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I like if you if you search through like my old deviant art, like from back when I was in high school, you'll find this long rant I went on in high school about how insulting it was when people would say, oh, you're so talented. And like the it's lately, not lately, lately I, I know, like, especially now when someone says that, it's just like, oh, thank you. And I know what they mean. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so happy that they say that to me. I, I really am grateful for any compliments. I'll soak them up all day. Um, yeah. No, 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 has no, uh, no problem with compliments for sure. But it, it's, I, I feel like, and I've even said it myself by accident. I feel like it's just such a part of our vocabulary to say, oh, you're so talented. And I've been working with myself to replace talented with skilled. Be like, yes. oh, wow, that artist is so skilled. That musician is so skilled. Because skill, the implication is more that it's something that person built with hard work and time and effort. And it is a better compliment for the artist to say you're so skilled because that acknowledges their hard work. I, I couldn't agree more and I couldn't agree. And, and it's not, again, it's not when people say that they don't, they don't mean it this yeah. way, but the, there's a subtext. That, if you were just popped out, you know, right. out of your mom's womb, able to paint. It's all exactly. it, painting minis. Exactly. It's all good. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. And, and there's, um, you know, there's, and there's so much misconceptions about art and, and that whole process, but uh, I've got a whole segment devoted to this. So we're not going <laughs> to use it all up right now. Um, but uh, I, it is, um, it's nice to talk to somebody else that um, thinks of it the same way that I do. Cause I thought it was a little bit alone on that though. I've talked to other mini painters and, and they're like, yeah, no, it's, um, you know, it's a little frustrating that people think that it's just talent when no, it's not, it's, yeah. it's, it takes time. Um, and, you know, even with drawing, because I like to draw too. Um, I didn't know that. I, that's, that's I did awesome. that long before. Yeah, and uh, paint on canvas and stuff like that. And yeah. that's all before I got into mini painting. And you know, my wife says to me, she goes, "You know, Craig, I can't draw." And I'm like, "No, you can. You can draw because drawing is about seeing. That's yeah. all drawing is. It's about it's about seeing the world. And then you know, it's not it's not dexterity. It's not it's not what you think it is. It's not your hand. <laughs> and, and actually, some of some of the, my favorite classes um, I've ever taught because I taught for a while at uh, Kendall College, and I had the opportunity to teach this class called design drawing, which was mostly incoming freshmen. And there were some illustration students, but there were also students going into visual art that wasn't drawing, like or some of it wasn't even visual art. There were students going into like sound design. Wow. Um, who and they they'd always be super nervous coming up to me at the beginning of the class, being like, "Oh, I don't I don't even know how to draw a stick figure." Like that's always the I don't I don't even know how to draw a stick figure. And <laughs> it was those were some of the most fun students to teach. Yeah. That. And we, we'd break it down. We'd slowly start learning how to draw the basic shapes and then how to combine those basic shapes. And I think the best teacher review I ever got that like made everything worth worth it was um, I got a review that said, I didn't think I would ever be able to draw. It was like, I didn't think I could draw. But now when I have an idea in my head, I can put it on paper. And I was just oh. like, oh. 
Like that's that was, amazing. That was the best compliment I've ever gotten oh, in my life. Oh, that's amazing. Well, you know what's funny uh, about someone saying I don't know how to draw stick figures is they don't realize that that's all you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like that's how you start. Yes, yeah, you yeah, start like is. every 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 time you draw a figure, it starts off as a stick figure. Yeah, which it is starts amazing. off as the uh, that Andrew Loomis um, basic stick figure with a little like yep. little bubble for the the torso and hips and head and yeah. That's funny, isn't it? That's funny. So, guys, the Insider Insight series allows me to talk to developers, designers, artists, writers, and industry insiders about their creative process and how they approach that work. And that's what I plan on doing with Alyssa today. So we're going to find out how she discovered and honed her talent. Look at that. In my script, I said talent. <laughs> so let's try that with today. We find out how Alyssa discovered and honed her skills and how she broke in into the industry. We're also going to get find out about her inspirations. We'll learn about her process and what it's like to be a freelance artist. So let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Howdy friends, Craig here. You deserve a new playmat. Here on the third floor, we use mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, almost free of glare and lighter than neoprene. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. You pick a mat, pick a design, and then you pick an overlay, like one for Marvel Crisis Protocol, Star Wars Legion, or even Malifaux 3rd Edition. Those overlays will really speed up your deployment and make the placement of objective markers so easy. Use our promotion code in the show notes to get a 10% discount on your first order. In the notes of your order, you can even request the third floor logo on your mat for free. That makes the best mat in the business even a little better. So get some new mats, save yourself some money, and help support the show. Go to matsbymars.com. All the details are in the show notes, including the discount code. So there was a day, Alyssa, that, um, you know, you sat down and, you know, you grabbed a pencil, a crayon or whatever it was, and you started expressing yourself visually. And, you know, if it was like me, it was just like, you know, I like this, like, I, I like doing this. So when you look back, when do you think that you started to realize that you enjoyed expressing yourself visually? Well, I think like, most artists, I or like most kids, I did a lot of drawing, a lot of sculpture, playing with Play-Doh, all that stuff as a little kid. And I remember I wanted to be an artist until I was about five. And then I decided that art wasn't a real career. Yeah. And so I was going to go into, uh, I was going to become a veterinarian. And I kept on that track until about my junior year of high school and wow. I had like a beginning of life crisis where I was like but why like I I don't necessarily want to do medical things like I'd, I'd been so focused on grades I'd been focused on <laughs> being in all the right clubs so I could get the right scholarships so I could go to the yeah. schools and I was just like I this realization that I didn't want to do that I I enjoyed painting and so I told my dad I was going to become an artist, bless his heart, is a little shocked, but um, ultimately supportive. And <laughs> it sounds like there might have been a few conversations, though. <laughs> yeah, he, it, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. I remember saying it to him, and he looked at me, and he was like, I thought you were going to be a math teacher. And I remember being like, when? When did what? <laughs> like, that's my worst subject. Why would I ever do that? Um, Hi, Dad. My name's Alyssa. We met you. <laughs> it's, it's just one of those, like, what? We were in very different pages. Oh, that's um, funny. But I, I remember I'd, I'd been drawing as kind of a significant hobby since middle school when I'd like gone to the bookstore and I picked up this like how to draw manga book and I brought oh, it nice. home and I'd like I'd like copy the person's like manga drawings and then I try and redraw it on my own. Yep. And then I started um, bringing home book covers like I'd, I'd, I'd ask for books. Um, when we were in the bookstore and I'd bring them home and I wouldn't read them. I'd just look at the covers yeah. and then I'd sit there and I'd, I'd, I'd try and replicate them. Uh, I just sit there and, for hours and hours and try and draw the beautiful, beautiful drawings on the covers. 
and slowly started to branch into, oh, maybe I could draw my own things and not just copy yeah. other things. And But that's yeah. how you learn. Yeah. I mean, uh, my version of that book is there was a book called How to Draw the Marvel Way. I have um, that book. It's a phenomenal it's, book. I, I, use, I, okay, I use stuff from that book still yep. today in the classroom when I'm teaching other people. That is a great book. Oh, it's it's phenomenal, and I'm I'm really mad because I can't remember the artist who did it. it was Basema, who the guy who wrote who drew uh, Conan for Marvel. Yeah. Um, he did it, and it's and I, and it's funny because the, the, I talk to artists, and it seems like every artist has a book like that that they that they wore all the pages out, right? Yeah. That they just obsessed over and paid. And and I remember to this day, and I'm we're talking about eight year old Craig, so it's yeah. a zillion years ago, but like page by page, and then finally, like, and it was you would start off copying it, right? So you would you would just trace it and then. Copy copy it, not really knowing what you were doing. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I remember uh, um, struggling with the concepts that he was teaching in the book, which are sound concepts, the concepts of, you know, 3d shapes and combining yeah. the 3d shapes and understanding it. Um, so um, yeah, totally get that. Totally get that. And drawing the Marvel way has a lot of really good stuff about setting up compositions that are, it's, it's a, still a really great book for anyone wanting to go into art. Like that's one of the best books you can get even. That, that's even so today. funny that you even know that book. That's I, I, hilarious. I, I own it. Yeah. I, I own that's it great. and I use it. It's a great book. Yep. It, um, my daughter has, uh, are shown abilities and, and an interest more than mm -hmm. anything. And, um, there's, it's very funny because like I'll see a drawing she does and I'll go, I, I'll see what's there. Right. Mm -hmm. And my, my wife will go, that's pretty good. And I'm like, no, honey, like, I don't think you realize like the concept she's already grasping. Yeah. Like, uh, she, like she did a, she did a picture and it had perspective. Oh, that's, and, that's and I'm like, honey, she's six. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, like, I'm, I'm teaching that this, this semester I'm teaching a perspective class at a, at CCS and there are college level kids who do not get perspective. Exactly. Like if your six year old gets perspective, that's awesome. Yeah. Like honey, she drew hit the hand closer and made it bigger. Like that's, that's a big deal. That's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it's amazing. So then, all right, so you graduate from high school. What's next? Uh, after, so I, I graduated high school and I had this incredible art teacher in senior year who, because I, I hadn't been preparing for art up to that point, right? So I hadn't right. had the prerequisites to go into her class. And I showed up to her class with some paintings I'd done. And I was like, I really want to be in your class. And I showed her my paintings and she gave me my first ever critique, which like I'd never been through a critique before. So that was right. kind of knocked me on my butt being like, wait, I'm not perfect. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> But she let me into her class, and during her class, she bullied us all into a bus on one weekend, drove us up to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and got us into a uh, portfolio review. The colleges were all there and all doing portfolio reviews, and she was like, you're all getting portfolio reviews to go wow. to art school. And like, I don't know if I would have done it if it wasn't for her. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Bowers, incredible, incredible lady. And... <laughs> So I wanted to like I wanted to get a portfolio review under my belt because there are all these colleges at these fancy tables and I was super nervous. And there was this one poor, sad little table that was just blank. Like there was there was this little I feel so bad. I feel like I'm I'm dissing my school. Um <laughs> it had this little piece of paper with like Kendall written in Sharpie, like taped to it. I was like, I'll just get one under my belt before I go to the other schools. And so I went up to them and the guy there immediately started apologizing. He was like, I'm so sorry, American Airlines lost all of our promotional material, our whole fancy table setup. It all is like got delivered to a different state. That's why our table oh. looks so sad. And that's why no one was there. Like that's the reason they didn't have a line. Yeah. And I was like, okay, whatever. And we did the portfolio review. Uh, it went pretty well. And then a couple months later in the mail, I got a letter saying I'd gotten a full scholarship to go wow. there. So I went to Kendall because American Airlines lost some luggage and everything in my life that has happened since then, like the person I met at college and married, the kid I've Isn't had, all of that is because American <laughs> Airlines lost some luggage. Like there's some luggage handler at American Airlines who I owe my entire life to. That's amazing. So for people listening that don't know what a portfolio review is, what is mm -hmm. what I mean, I like the words yeah. give us a little bit of a hint. But so what happens? You walk up. Yeah, I walk up with with my little portfolio you know, shaking in my boots and I show it to a person who uh, looks through it and depending on the review will give me a critique on what I could do better. 
And in this case, the review was whether or not I could get into the school. But later on at conventions, portfolio reviews are about whether or not you get work at the company. Right. So they're, they're kind of like a continuing theme through the art world. You, you keep getting portfolio reviews. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure they ever get less terrifying, but uh, well, and yeah. I have never been through anything like that, Alyssa. And I, um, I can be sensitive of, about it because it, so people critique my podcast. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, whatever, you know, yeah. because I have some confidence about yeah. what I do, and I like I kind of know what I'm doing, and I feel good about it. But I'm, I'm very insecure about my art, especially like miniatures. I've gotten enough feedback on that I'm kind of bulletproof there too yeah someone could say like uh, that sucks i'm like okay well i don't care about you anyway yeah but like if i draw something and someone critiques it it's a little little tough so like when do you feel like you started to build up the armor where you could withstand critique and and digest it um take the good and the bad because just because someone's critiquing you doesn't mean they know what the hell they're talking about right yeah so you have to learn to learn to figure out when to listen and when to when to not so when do you feel like you were able to pick that up or is that an ongoing thing um for for art anymore i feel pretty confident in my ability to take critiques but i feel like taking critiques is a skill just yeah. like art um being able to take and give critiques is a skill And when I was teaching that intro drawing class, like that was something we would talk about is how to take and how to give uh, critique. And yeah, like the first critique I got, like, again, when I showed my drawings to that uh, senior art teacher the first time and she dared to suggest they weren't the most perfect things ever to grace the (laughs) art world. Um, It was such a shock. I'd never had anyone look at my work and be like, this could be better. And like, it was it was it was such a huge shock and like i was it rocked my world a little bit and then once i adjusted to it and again i'm so lucky to have had this starting in high school yeah. and you start to start to see it less as a critique of um of, of your abilities and more of a a compliment to your potential of oh you can that's a great way to do put better it. like this is yeah. how you can be even better and you're capable you're right? capable you're, you're capable of doing even more and yep. and critiques are the best part of art school they're the thing I, when you talk to artists a lot of them miss is having that group critique because yeah when you're having a critique you're getting feedback on how to get better and when you're painting on your own and you finish it and you just stand back and it's just silence in the room it can it's like well did i do good how do i do better like having that peer input yeah. is is so critical and that's not to say it's always easy like in in master in my the master's program i went to at a hartford art school i did i did get a critique that made me cry <laughs> like it, it still happens yeah. sure um, but but the biggest part i think when you talk about like some critiquers know what they're saying some don't uh you can judge that it, it can be it can be hard to be objective about your own work but when you see mm-hmm. them critiquing other people's work and you're like oh they have a point on all those other people's work and then they get to you and they say something really harsh and it's like, Oh God, it's true. (laughs) But, but then I I think the sign of a grid critiquer is they don't just tell you what's wrong. They give you clues on how to fix it or they, they give you, um, they give you pointers on how to make it better. So it's not just like, Oh, you suck. It's like, Oh, well this element sucks. You can improve it by going and looking at these other artists or here you can take better reference photos. It's like 90% of critiques oh. I give, I swear. And critiques like that too. It's like get better reference. Oh, um, that's funny. And yeah, that's it's the improvement element I think that that separates a a genuine constructive criticism right. um that from just somebody, you know, saying bad things about you. Well, and my next question was going to be, you know, what does it mean? What does a good critique look like? But I think you've already told us, which is, you know, find out points that have opportunity mm-hmm. and and kind of push them down the path. Does that sound like, yeah. you know, what you consider a good critique? Yeah. And it, it's really interesting. Uh, like, I remember in art school, I had the wrong attitude towards critiques i always went into the critique hoping the art teacher would just look at it and say it's perfect like that's all (laughs) i wanted um and now as as a teacher when i have a student and they they give me a piece if i can't come up with a way to tell them that they could improve i feel like they've wasted their tuition on me like if i can't like if they just if i can't help them get to a a better picture if i can't help them level up then what are they paying me for like right. if they just want someone to tell them they're great like 
you have a best friend, have a, have your mom look at it and be like, great job. <laughs> like that's, that, that's not, that's not worth the tuition money. I want to be able to help them level up and anymore as a working professional, when I send my work to colleagues to get feedback on, or when they send their work to me, it's never to just say, oh, it's great. Yeah. It's because something's not working and I need help fixing it. And yep. they'll look at it and be like, oh, your contrast is off here. Here's like, if you made this darker and this lighter and then sharpened up the details here, it'll work. And it's like, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then you do it and suddenly the painting works. Um, and, and so I feel like in art school, I, even even though I was getting more used to getting feedback, it took me a while to really understand the spirit of the critique, which is to improve. Yeah. Fresh eyes are so critical. Yeah. So, so critical because you, you get so lost in what you're doing that like I'm amazed and I, and I apologize. I keep like mirroring myself with with miniatures but it's the only thing i really know yeah. um but, well, art is but like, art <laughs> yeah i'm amazed like well, i'll paint a whole miniature mm -hmm. and i i mean i have and you you know you know how people paint miniatures they yeah. got their hands right next to you know i have gone and i've looked at that freaking thing for five <laughs> hours i'm done and i'm like i finished it i'm happy with it I'm, I'm i'm proud so i go to my light box i put it in the light box i take a picture i rotate it take a picture and rotate it and missed like a whole section un <laughs> unpainted. Yeah. Just sitting there. And I'm yeah. like, how the hell does that happen? But it's exactly what you're talking it, about. It happens with, with paintings too. And, yeah. and that's why I'll, um, I'll pull in another artist for paintings when I can is I'll, I'll, you get so used to staring at it. You almost become blind to sections of it. And they'll send it to another artist. And they'll be like, what's going on with the foot? And it's like, oh yeah, the foot's not done. <laughs> Yeah, you should have two of them. Yeah. I've, I've done that. I've gotten the wrong. I've gotten like the wrong number of fingers before. Like not noticed. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so funny, isn't it? Yeah. It um one of the dumbest things, uh, and my mom uh, fostered me as an artist. And uh, one of the things that she taught me, and my was my first exposure to that was taking a picture and you draw a picture and then you put it to a mirror. Mm -hmm. Oh and God! Yeah. Ten, ten years old, it blew my mind. Like I would draw a picture and be like, I'm happy with this stuff, put it up to a mirror and immediately you're like, oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. And it's just because it's a fresh set of eyes. I didn't discover that until I was in high school. In my senior yeah. year of high school, I just happened to walk by a mirror while holding one of my paintings and I stopped and I stared. I was like, that's not my painting. <laughs> I was like, it's something's amazing. wrong. I yeah. looked at it and I, you know, I look at my painting. I look at the mirror. I was like, that's not right. I was like, maybe this is just some like optical mirror illusion. So I got someone yeah. else's painting. I yeah. put it in front of the mirror. I'm like, no, that still looks good. Why does yeah. my painting not look good anymore? It's incredible. It's, and, it's, oh, it's, it's, it was so heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So it's amazing. Yeah. So you go to college, um, yeah. you go to school and it sounds like you went um, beyond just uh, a four year. It sounds like you went to a master's program. Uh, well, I started with just the four year. I started at Kendall College and mm -hmm. I graduated and I started working in the produce section at Myers. Okay. Um, that which was, many artists do. Yeah, that was my first job out of school. And it was actually kind of great. I'd work from 4 a.m. to noon. And then I'd have the rest of the day to paint. Nice. Um, and I had been doing, for some reason in my head, I thought I was going to do children's book illustration. And I think it was because I didn't really know what other sorts of illustration there were. I was just like, I should yep. do illustration as a job. And I was like, well, children's book illustration is a thing. But I had mm -hmm. no I had no desire to actually do that kind of work. But I'd build up this whole portfolio around it. And I was doing, you know, little bits of freelance work here and there for different clients and just hating every second of it. And it took about a year for me to realize that I really did not enjoy what I was doing. And I was wow. like, I kind of went back to the beginning. I was like, what was it that I like to do? And I like to go to the sci-fi fantasy section of Barnes and Noble buy a bunch of books that I had no intention of reading and then copy their book covers. I loved the sci-fi fantasy books. And so I was like, I really want to do that. But I looked at my work and I was like, I am not there. Like the skill level was yeah. just not there. Um, and so I was like, I need to go back to school. And that's how I ended up going to uh, Hartford Art School. Gotcha. So out of curiosity, then, what was it about the fantastical that that drew you? Why? Why was why, what's drawing that? Why does that matter to you? I think it was just a genre I was always into. And I was, I think, lucky enough to have um, parents who were super into that genre, too. That might have been part of it. Like, I remember sure. in first and second grade, my dad would 
sit there and he, you know, he'd read me uh, The Hobbit as a bedtime story. And then he'd read me uh, Terry Pratchett books as a bedtime story. And I don't think I got most of the jokes in like first grade, but I still laugh anyway. I still <laughs> thought it was great. Don't get Terry Pratchett. <laughs> yeah, he, he, I, I, was, I was super into Terry Pratchett, though. I dressed up as the luggage for Halloween. Very uh, we, nice. we made a little a little box and he'd ring the door. My dad would ring the doorbell and step back and people would open the door and I'd just be this trunk with a bunch of little legs on the side and they'd stare Phenomenal. at it. And I'd open the lid and it'd have all these teeth in and uh, it was, <laughs> I loved it. I, I was super into it. Um, but I, my dad just had so many sci-fi fantasy books and Got it. just piles and he doesn't for some reason still doesn't have bookshelves they're just stacked like from <laughs> on the carpet they're just lying the walls like almost almost like a what do you call it wainscoting like they're just like stacked so high all along the walls and if you want a book that's on the bottom of the pile you better be brave <laughs> because that pile is going to fall on you that's funny but you know he had he had all the classics so growing up you know i had i had terry pratchett i had neil gaiman i had uh, larry niven i had um oh gosh oh, your father's got good taste oh That's yeah good oh stuff. yeah there's um there's oh there's so much so many good yeah. classic sci-fi fantasy uh you know isaac asimov of course all all yep. those still, so still, love clicked, the, clicked... still love the cable seal series it's still one of my favorite God, Alyssa, oh, you're, you're freaking me out a little <laughs> bit because you, i'm a huge asimov fan yeah. and and that's the book i go to for people i say read caves of steel yeah don't I, read foundation I, foundations I, later i i, I honestly like i, I have it's an okay asimov, to like, it's yeah okay. I, I have an asimov friend who will will like oh if he hears this but like i don't well, love the foundation series but that is that is okay but the that is caves okay. of steel series is one of oh. my all-time favorite all time the favorite. robot novels are unbelievable yeah. they're unbelievable and it um and and and, and Believe it or not, this is Pratchett's this way too, which is they 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 wrote in the fantastical, mm -hmm. but instead of it being like Asimov didn't with Foundation he did, but with the Robot series he didn't write sci-fi novels. Science fiction was the setting. Mm -hmm. He wrote detective stories. Yeah, and, and that's what that's what made him great. And Pratchett's the same way. So what what Pratchett used the fantasy as a setting to write his stories about yeah. people and it uh it's it's that's very cool yeah, yeah very very authors. cool so i'd be curious then so you you sit there and go shoot you know i i, I need some more learning right mm -hmm. I, I i'm not quite here yet so you, you go uh there and but now you're a little bit more focused right you yeah. have a better sense of of what you what you want to get out of this next this next set of learning so you finish school or mm -hmm. does something happen in school that's significant for you um leading to professional life um, something was significant, and that was the program itself. It was the Hartford Art School uh, Low Residency Master's Program. And it was really cool in that the teachers were full-time working illustrators, and most of the other, like, most of my classmates were full-time working professionals. Wow. And one of my, like, the, the person, he was, like, two classes above me, so he was leaving the program just as I was coming in. Uh, we only had like one session where it was overlapped, but uh, Scott Murphy uh, does, he's a, a Wizards of the Coast artist, does lots of work for them. And I i walked up to him like my first summer there, it's like my second week and he was painting and it was, he was actually painting a piece for Wizards of the Coast at the time. And I sat down and I was like, so I want your job. How, <laughs> how do I get your job? Yeah. And he was so cool. He like, put his painting aside i didn't realize it but he had like a deadline like the next day but he like put his painting aside and he turned around he's like so you're interested in tabletop games and he gave me so much advice oh and, that's cool and he was like okay you need to go to gen con here's some things you need for your portfolio he gave me so much advice and i ended up building my thesis around wanting to go into tabletop games and then after my first year you know halfway through the program i took like my halfway unfinished thesis to gen con and went around asking for art directors and showing it to them. And it was, they gave me all this feedback. Like a lot of it was, you're not ready yet, but they told me why. And that was the key. Nice. They're like, okay, we can't hire you yet. And here's why. And they told me why. And then I got their email addresses. So then the second half of my thesis, I was able to update and make more targeted. And at the same time, I was starting to pick up work and I was starting to be able to email out updates to those companies I was super interested in working in. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, so 
you, at what point out of college, did mm-hmm. you go freelance or did you start working for a company or, so I'm trying to get a sense career wise, yeah. what that path is. Cause there's both, right? Yeah. There's you, you work full time for a company. Other times you're freelance. What does that path look like for you? I started picking up enough freelance work to be uh, full time about three quarters of the way through the master's program. I was starting to pick up a lot of work. Um, and when I finally when I graduated, that next Gen Con is when I really started picking up work. Um, Got it. That's like that's when um, I, I picked up Weird as a freelance client. And I'd originally, when I went by Weird the first Gen Con, it was a solid no. You're you're not you're not ready yet. And when I yep. I hit them up the second time, I was able to start getting work, and that picked up more and more, and eventually turned after like close-ish to a year turned into a full-time job uh in-house okay so so at that point you go to atlanta Mm -hmm. and i was in atlanta for a bit yep doing the in-house stuff which was it was definitely a a big change up from freelance and i don't it was interesting because i'd always thought that in-house work was the way i wanted to go but i'm I'm glad i got to experience both because in-house work definitely has some advantages Freelance work also definitely has some advantages. Well, so let's talk about the in-house advantages. Yeah. So what, what, what's good about working in-house? I think the best part of working in-house is actually getting to be in the same room with the game designers. And when you hear them talk about the game, it's a lot different than just getting an email saying, okay, here's the ideas. When you actually hear them like brainstorming and, yep. and then you can jump in and, and be more uh, be a more organic part of the process. I think that was the coolest part of being in-house. Um, other parts of being in-house that more on the, I guess, the the drier technical side is just as a freelancer, it's really irritating to prove your income. It's really nice as yeah. an in-house person to just be like, oh, yes, here's the two-week check stub that apartments always ask for. Yep. And it's also really nice having your taxes taken out of your paycheck for you. I hate, as a freelancer, I hate having to take out, like having taxes taken out of your, your income is hard enough, but when you have to do it yourself, it's just, yep. it's just extra painful. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> well, when you're in house, you don't see it, right? Yeah, so you, it's just, you, 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 it you get disappears. The and then at the end of the year, it's like, oh, look, this return, where's the yeah. freelancer? That money's there, like in the savings account, I've been putting it aside <laughs> and then, you know, tax time comes and you have to spend it and it's, it's, it's all gone. It's like, oh, <laughs> Oh, so yeah. I, I imagine the stability. I would assume that's part of it, right? Is so the fact that you've you you, you your income's a known quantity at that point. Um, it's it depends. Like it in some ways, yes. Like you know what's happening next week, but there's also in some ways a little less stability in that you are tied to one company and got it. You rise and fall with that one company. Um, and there was very. Very and freelance takes a while because there's a gap between when you get the job and when you get paid, or even when you there's a gap between when you ask for the job, when you let the art director know you're available, when you get the project, when you finish the project, then when you get paid, right. there can be a long gap. And to build up enough steam to have a, those paychecks coming in regularly takes a little bit of time. And there was always the kind of knowledge that if anything happened, I would be stuck in Atlanta. Which mm. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't love Atlanta. I love the people there. I love the restaurant. Yep. Didn't, didn't love the food. So good. Oh, in Atlanta. the food is so good. I, I didn't, I didn't love the traffic. Um, no. I didn't, I didn't love the prices or, or the wages of the uh, other, yep. of their surrounding businesses. Like the minimum wage is still like sevens, whatever, but the rent was still the same as much <laughs> uh, as, as in Michigan. Like it, the, the rent was the same as it is here in Ann Arbor, but in Ann Arbor, like, you start the the jobs that are playing seven dollars in Atlanta pay like twelve fifty here. Right. So it's a, a big difference. Like even being like, okay, if if something happens and I'm like out there working in the produce section again, like I'm not going to be able to make rent. Like I'm yeah. I'm all dependent on this one string. Whereas as a freelancer, you have multiple companies and there's multiple streams of income. So like if one stream goes dry, you've got other streams coming in, and it feels it. it, it like in some ways it's there's less um in some ways I, I can see how it feels like there's less stability because you don't know there's a job coming the next week. Yeah. But at the same time, if you've you've it, it's kind of like 
you've just got all these all these different uh kind of bets on all these different horses <laughs> and it, it, right. it's not just on on one which which does feel nice as well well and the the, the key for freelance mm-hmm. and, I, and i've talked to several freelance artists um and writers mm-hmm. and it sounds like the key to freelance is is once you once you build the bed right once you have built your stable mm-hmm. of of clients um you can you can get to the point where you're almost if not explicitly turning work away and then you know then then you get the cycle that you talked about because you know you can't go crap rents due at the end of the month i better go find work yeah because you're not going to get that check in time (laughs) right yeah it's Um, it's very like i I have a couple clients that pay like immediately upon delivery or pay so i have one client that pays in advance and they're just like oh they're, they're amazing. <laughs> no kidding um but but most of the time there's at least a 30-day gap and then mm-hmm. that might take you know a couple of weeks to finish the project so it yeah. just and then quite often you'll have a company be late and you'll be like hey what's up and they'll be like oh i've got a kickstarter that's going to be finished in a couple months you'll get paid then and it's like that's <sighs> great you shouldn't have bought my work if yeah. you didn't have the money for it already unfortunately the, the tabletop uh tabletop genre in general tends to be a little bit bad about that when it comes to pain pain artists on time you quickly find the the clients that are really good about it and you know hoard them because they're they're precious I, i'm sure and and, and, and... It's part of the nature of the industry. Um, there's professionals and non-professionals, and they're all in this industry. Yeah. Um, and and uh, that's got to be a struggle because um, I would imagine there are people that, with a with a straight face, said that to you. Said you know you know yeah, it'll be a couple weeks, yeah. but we'll get you paid. Not understanding what they're saying. Not understanding like you you are you are being unprofessional. You and, are. <laughs> and it's really it's really hard because quite often I think the people who are telling me that do know what they're saying. Like I've I've some of and you'd be surprised you'd think oh the smaller companies will be the ones doing this a lot of times it's the bigger companies yeah and i always feel bad because it's the art directors do not have control over the budget so i know when they're the ones giving me the bad news like they're not they don't they're they're just the messenger they're they're my advocate in the company yep um and i always feel bad uh, when when people turn around and bite the art director because i i it's sometimes it's they're they're a lot of times they're trying their best yeah but um the tabletop games i think i think because tabletop games in general tends to run on such a slim profit margin yep it's i found especially for rpgs i found the the odds of getting paid late are much higher than with miniatures with miniature companies i'm much more likely to get paid on time or early whereas with the rpgs working with with book sales it's much more likely to be a, a lower budget, much less likely, much more likely to have the uh, payment come in a little bit late. I, I think there's a lot of people listening don't realize what a tough business RPGs are. Yeah. Um, as, as, and, you know, you think your, your initial, so the initial take for a lot of people is like, well, you know, they're not making miniatures. They're not, uh, you know, they're not paying artists to do 3D renders. They're not creating molds and, you know, sending stuff off to China. All they're doing is printing books. Well, if I'm going to play Malifaux, I buy all my miniatures. Yeah. And if my buddy comes over to play Malifaux, he buys all his miniatures. Yeah. I've got a rule book. He's got a rule book. With RPG, I buy the RPG book as the GM. And then I have like seven people come over yeah. and they, they don't spend a dime. <laughs> and, <laughs> right? and even more than that, like you talk about, oh, hiring the artist to do a 3D render, but you hire that one sculpt and then you make a ton of money from that right. one sculpt. Whereas with an yep. RPG, I think the rule of thumb is you want a new piece of art like every three pages um, in general. And yeah. even higher quality books like Wizards of the Coast will have a unique piece of art almost every page, even if it's just it's a amazing. sketch. And that's expensive. Yep. Um, that's so expensive. And then to sell it as a book, which, again, not everyone who plays the game is going to buy, like, that's that's a tough market. And it, it it's a it's really tough. saturated market, too. So it's it's definitely, definitely tough. Um, so did, did you work in-house for anybody other than Weird? Um, after I left Weird and after my non-compete with Weird was up, I ended up working in-house with uh, Dogmite for a little bit. Oh, okay. And, yeah. I'm a huge fan of them. Oh, yeah. They're, they're fun people. Um, I worked with Dogmite for a bit, and I still do some freelance work with them. They're, they're definitely uh, fun people. I can't. 
I can't wait to get my labyrinth Kickstarter. I still uh, haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> I have, my mother-in-law, he keeps saying like, when is it coming? I paid for it. I'm like, I swear it's coming. I so swear. for those listening, um, <laughs> I, uh, I had become a fan of Alyssa's. God, it's got to be two or three years now that I've been a fan of yours and um, dog might who I uh, I've got, I own their GM screen. I've got a beautiful GM screen of theirs and some other wooden components of theirs uh, found out that they were doing a Kickstarter game, uh, this labyrinth game. And um, I remember looking at it going, man, I, I just, I really, really like this. And then I realized it was you and I'm like, pledge. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It was so much fun working on that with Lindsay. It's gorgeous. Oh, it's, it was so much fun working on that. Um, and actually, speaking of dog, my anyone who ever orders a custom screen from them or a custom dice tower, like if it if it needs a sketch, like I'm, they'll uh, they'll hire that out to me. So yeah, any anyone wants a uh, <laughs> wants a custom uh, dog might screen. Oh, that's, I'm uh, I'm such a show for them. They're so they're that's, they're, that's they're really fun to work with, and I'll I'll do the sketch, and then it goes to their sculptor Mike Cameron, and and it it is really fun to see to see like the final sketch come out like in wood all carved and it's like oh you touch it it's, gorgeous. it's, like, oh. it's, it's just such a cool <laughs> tactile thing to see to see my art on wood it's really fun so uh you work for dogma for a bit um and then you decide you know what i'm just gonna do this on my own then i the i i, I worked full-time for dogma for a little bit and then i transitioned doing part-time while i built back up the freelance work and uh, now I'm full-time freelance again, and I do teach a class over at the uh, College for Creative Studies, TJ Perspective class, <laughs> which is like the math of the art world. I feel so bad for the students. Like you see them coming with just like dread in their eyes. <laughs> it's like, no, we'll make it fun. I swear. Get your protractor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, I, we, they have their little protractors. Uh, oh, that's yeah. funny. Um, so I, there's a lot of people listening, Alyssa, that. Um, uh, I don't fully understand what freelance means. I mean, they understand, you know, uh, they can, they can yeah. define it. Right. Um, and there's, there's the perception and then there's the reality. Yeah. Um, so let's first talk about what's awesome. So you being freelance, what, what do you love about the fact that you don't work in house anywhere? I love the freedom of it. Um, I yeah. love if my interest shifts I can shift my artwork. So for a while there, I was like super into robots and I was able to draw up some robots and send it to some people and get some jobs drawing robots. And yep. like, that's not necessarily something you can do in house when you're in house, your job is whatever the company's jobs are with freelance. You have the ability to, to shift around a little bit more and be like, Oh, I'm a little more, more interested in this. And you have the ability to set your own hours. Um, you can live wherever you want. So long mm -hmm. as you have an internet connection, it's, I can work with my dogs. That's, that's <laughs> the best part. Having my dogs uh, sitting around me while I work is definitely, definitely. I yeah. work from home. It's the best. <laughs> yes. Yes. Having the big floofers. Yep. Yep. So what is the, uh, what do people not realize? I think people don't realize how much, like, I, I feel like when people think of, uh, of like, oh, this person's an artist. They imagine someone sitting there in a studio going like, ah, oh, what shall I paint today? <laughs> Waiting for like the great muse to strike them with inspiration. Uh, when a lot of it is like, as much as I love it, it is very much a job, you know, like the alarm clock goes off, you get up, yep. get get my coffee, eat, eat some oatmeal, drag myself into the computer, computer room, spend, you know, the first 30 minutes to 45 minutes answering emails. Then I, you know, I have a, a whole board of client notes printed up next to my Cintiq that I, I have, you know, the important bits highlighted. So as I'm drawing, I can look up and remind myself, okay, this is what the client wants. And it's less yeah. about, especially when you, I feel like you're in the commercial arts, it's less about, you know, this great creative artistic vision and more about bringing your client's vision to life in a lot of ways. And it, yeah. it is, and there are... The, like I, as much as I love my job, there are plenty of days when I don't feel like painting, but I still have to get up and paint. Um, and I feel like that's when people imagine being an artist, they don't necessarily think about the days when you're, you know, on your fifth cup of coffee and you're exhausted and you just are not interested in the project, but you can't let that show because if it shows yeah. that you're not interested in the drawing, 
then that client, even if that client, like the client will pay you, but you, you probably aren't going to get any more work from them. Cause right. if you have asked the project, like that's going to be it from them. And they might, when they're talking to their art, dir- art director friend, they might be like, Hey, this artist, you know, they seem like they were good, but when the time came, they dropped the ball on this project that was really important to us. And yep. so you, you, you yep. can't let that disinterest show, which on some days can be really rough if you're just not invested. You got to fake it. <laughs> I'm sure. And be a tradesman to a certain yeah. degree, right? Less less an artist and more of a tradesman um, in, in that respect. And, you know, the it being a job has mm-hmm. got to be a challenge. Um, I, um, I very rarely take commissions Mm -hmm. for my painting for that exact reason because i i paint when i feel like painting yeah and you don't want me to paint something when i don't feel like painting you don't want that (laughs) because i'm not like you i can't i don't have that discipline and skill yet to be able to sit down and just bang it out and have it look good um i have to i have to I have weird stuff that has to happen in my head first, you know, yeah. before I can, before I can do it. So the few times I take commissions, um, I say to them, look, you're going to get it cheaper elsewhere and they're going to be as good, if not better than me. And they'll get it to you faster. Mm-hmm. Um, all I can promise you is that I will have it done at some point. And as a result, you know, I, you know, price it yeah. as such, but it, it um, I'm not making a living at it. So that I, I, I it, I don't think people realize that, Alyssa, and yeah. it, and that is something that I would imagine you have had to develop over time is that ability, to, you know, to put your big boots on and say, look, you know, not only am I going to make this today because I have commitments and deadlines, but it's going to be good. Is there any for people out there? Is there anything that has worked for you to um, to inspire you to sit down and do the work and, and be proud of that work? I think. A big part is making sure your portfolio isn't going to attract too much work that you don't want. So to try it, to try and cut it off, try and head it off at the pass. Um, And there's lots of advice out there from all kinds of different artists about what you should put in your portfolio. But at the end of the day, the work that should go in your portfolio is the work you want to do more of. So there's lots of work I've done that does not go in my portfolio because Mm -hmm. I do not want to do more of it. Um, Pretty much, pretty much anything with steampunk goggles like, stays out of my portfolio. <laughs> I don't want to do any more steampunk goggles. <laughs> Those things are so hard to paint. I, I don't want them on their eyes. I don't want it on their head. I, I keep, I around keep, their neck. I keep getting jobs with steampunk goggles, and I, I, I finally broke down and I got some for reference, so I wouldn't keep screwing them up. But I'm still not going to put them in my portfolio oh, just because I don't like. I can. I'll do my best job and. Sure. And especially if I get if I get the um, like I recently got a steampunk goggles commission from a company I love that I'm a huge fan of. And I was like, okay, I'll give you my best steampunk goggles. But like, it's not going to go in my portfolio just because that's not what I enjoy. Sure. Um, So you try and put stuff in your portfolio that you enjoy. So you get more of it. But then and ideally you get into a point where you can take on the jobs that you like the most. And if you do have a job you're not super psyched about. some sometimes it's just just sucking it up and doing it and i'll I'll put a tv show on that i really like that I, I i like to have i have these tv shows that i like but not enough to actually distract me from working like yep. stargate is like my go-to tv show of like it's perfect background noise so it's going on it's entertaining me but i'm not going to be looking at it instead of my artwork and, yep. and that'll just like it'll just it's like a continuative narrative that i can just keeps my brain going while i just get through get through the uh get through the work and like sometimes podcasts um critical role did it for me for a while like nice it's anything anything to just keep your mind going while you just get through the day (laughs) yeah yeah i listen to podcasts when i paint um so i i I totally get that well guys we're going to take a break when we get back from this break i want to dig in a little bit into the process so i want to understand how Alyssa goes from nothing exists to the client discussion, to the tools that she uses to create her amazing art and uh, what it's like to uh, like know when it's finished. So let's take a break. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm James Hahn, and I'm a patron of Third Floor Wars because I'm a henchman who loses most of his games and the podcast has tons of valuable information to improve your play as well as what to expect from other crews. You can support them, too. The link is in the show notes, or just search for Third Floor Wars on Patreon.com. What is it worth to you to get this podcast on a weekly basis? 
is worth a dollar a month, five dollars a month, twenty dollars a month. If you'd like to help support the work that we're doing here on Third Floor Wars, please go buy our Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash third floor wars. There you can pledge at any level, any dollar amount. Whatever you give us will help us put out quality content on a regular basis and hopefully make tabletop gaming a little bit better for you every week. Time to give a shout out to our newest patrons. A big special thanks goes to James Kahn, Rage Quit Wire, Deck Roll, Aloy, Robo Rotten, Jacob Suderman, Joshua Hatch, Donald Kroger, John Fox, and David Gadea. Because of you and the 100 plus that are supporting us on Patreon, we're able to put out regular content on a weekly basis. We appreciate it. So let's say you've, uh, you've got a client and then client mm-hmm. says, um, you know, we want you to do some work for us. This is what we're thinking. What does the initial, initial discussion look and sound like? Ideally, the initial discussion looks and sounds a lot like what you just said of where they actually tell me what they want. <laughs> um, unfortunately, and I, I want to say this for anyone listening to this this podcast who may be interested in commissioning an artist, um, one of the best things you can do is to give that information when you approach yeah. the artist. Now, if I have a client I've worked with a lot and they're a regular client, I know what they want. I know what they're like to work with. I know what their rates are. And if they just shoot me an email saying you available for work. That's normal. Yep. Totally normal. But I'll get a lot of emails and I know a lot of artists who complain about getting these emails from someone they've never worked with. They don't know anything about them. And it'll just say, are you available for work? And it's like, well, what kind of work? Yeah. When, when do you need it by? Uh, what, what, what are your rates? When, what kind of rights are you looking for by, you know, do you want a portrait of your dog or do you need an entire card game illustrated like you? And I know a lot of artists who just don't respond to those emails because yeah. you get so many and because you as an artist then have to sit there and track down and drag out each little piece of information from them. So just you, you know, shout out anyone looking to commission an artist, the best, <laughs> the best email you could send to someone you've never worked with before would be like, hello, you know, I'm so-and-so I've got this project, you know, I'm looking to commission a couple uh, sample pieces for a Kickstarter. I'm going to be launching in April. I need these pieces by March. Mm -hmm. Um, they're going to be, you know, three characters, no background, sci-fi genre mixed with horror. Uh, (laughs) what are your rates? Like that would be, that would be a normal email to an artist that the artist could then quickly respond to. But and have enough time, information to yeah. actually give a give a rate, <laughs> and and that and that makes you look professional too. If you approach yeah. with that, the artist is like, "Oh, this person is someone who who knows what I need to know, yeah. and can respond with a rate." Or, or sometimes the artists the artists always get nervous quoting prices. Sometimes they'll be like, "Well, what is your budget?" And yeah. then you'll be like, "What are your rates?" And the artist will be like, "What is your budget?" And you'll be like, "What are your rates?" <laughs> uh, everyone hates that standoff. That's the worst standoff. I um, bet. <laughs> it's it's good to have an idea what the industry rates are, but it, the artist at some point, if if the client isn't isn't coughing up the budget, just give them give them a, a rate. Yeah. Don't, don't don't pull don't pull the standoff forever. It's the worst. Yeah. Um. But yeah, and and so you you ideally, I don't have to drag that information out of a client. Ideally, they have it there for me. Right. Uh, experienced clients. Uh, a lot of times we've already negotiated the price at a portfolio review or they'll have set prices for their company and they'll send me an art brief, which will be a brief description of what they need done and sometimes some reference images. Okay. So like for Flying Frog, they they wanted some they, they wanted a scene with some characters from their minis. So like they sent me images of those minis. They sent me a description of what they wanted the scene to be. And then I do up a couple of uh, client thumbnails. And I'll start by doing brain barf thumbnails, which are basically just incomprehensible doodles, scribbles. Right. No one but me can understand them. And even I can't understand them all the time. I'll look back and be like, oh, I don't know what that was. <laughs> so, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But um, but but then once, once you know, you get the brain barf out of your head, then you move on to the client, client sketches, which are, are cleaned up small little mini versions of the painting that show the composition that show uh the narrative if there's space if you know there needs to be text on the image you'll have left space for that text 
and the art director will then give feedback based on that initial client sketch. So you've done that. The art director says, yeah, this is, this is what we're thinking. This is what we want. Um, now, all that sketching you're doing on the computer? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just out of curiosity, what, like, specifically, are you using Wacom tablet or what software do you use? Like, what are you drawing? I use a Wacom Cintiq okay. and I draw in Photoshop. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, art director comes back and says, yeah, this is, this is what we're thinking. So, so what's next? Now what do we do? And a lot of times they won't, like, if I'm lucky, they'll be like, oh, I want thumbnail number three. But a lot of times it's like, oh, we want a combination of this from thumbnail <laughs> one and this from yeah. thumbnail four. Or I'll get the, the best art directors are the ones that will actually draw on top of the thumbnails and be like, we want it like this, but a little bit more like this. And they draw on top. And I'm like, oh, I don't have to, like, try and interpret a huge paragraph of text. Nice. I see what they want. That I love art directors who do paint overs. Yeah. Um, but the next part is to, for me, gather reference images, which is the part that I'm trying to improve on right now, is getting better reference images so I can really step up the quality, even even if I'm doing more stylized work, so I'm not faking things like the cloth and the hair that I really shouldn't be faking at this point. I should be getting good reference for. And this last Halloween, I hit up uh, Spirit of Halloween, like the day after Halloween and, and bought this huge thing of like costumes when they were 50% off. Wow. And so I've actually got got more uh, more materials to take reference photos with. So I'm hoping that'll help in the future. And then so I, I, use those, I use those references to, to do a more detailed drawing, which then the art director will usually approve or ask for more changes. And then it finally goes to the paint after all that. Got it. Now, it, that's curious to me, like, I'm an old dude, right? So, so like, when I was drawing, there there was there was no Google images. Yeah. And in my, and now there are times when I draw that I'll just go to Google images to find my reference photos. Um, yeah. But you are actually still doing what I used to do 20 years ago, which is actually creating reference photos. Why is that? Why not just take Take the fact that every picture every taken is searchable now. <laughs> copyright law. <laughs> That's what um, I was going to guess. Yeah. yeah. And even, even if copyright wasn't an issue, trying to find the perfect pose for right. what you had in your head, it's very rarely going to happen. And Got I it. see this with students a lot. And everyone, like, not everyone, a lot of people hate taking reference photos, myself included. I just want to be able to pull the information out of my brain or yep. search in Google and find it. But a lot of times you have to compromise the pose you had in mind to fit the reference images that you can find online. And that's not something you want to do. And yep. so I'll have students in class. They'll be like, I'll be like, why isn't this like your the, the client sketch that you drew for me? Why is the final different? They're like, oh, I couldn't find reference pictures online. And it's like, Phew. no, <laughs> take your own <laughs> reference photos. You're never going to find the perfect reference photo online. You, you might find it almost, but from a slightly different yep. angle. And that's no good. You have to take your own reference. So this is going to be my dumb question, one of many, I'm sure. Uh, what 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 does taking a reference photo mean? So what do you do? You you find somebody who, like, what's that mean? It's not a dumb question at all. Um, it's right now what that means for me is either dressing up my poor husband <laughs> as whatever I need him to be, and then me taking a photo with. Uh, uh, with this like 15 year old DSLR, so the ancient camera. <laughs> but the benefit of the the DSLRs over the uh, the camera phones is you don't get the wide angle distortion. Uh, yep. If you can if you can get the that 30 30 or 50 millimeter lens, it makes such a huge difference. Um, yeah. And I have I have lights set up and. Yeah, I have to put the dogs in their crate or else they get involved. <laughs> and so the dogs, the crate happens to be behind the area I'm taking reference photos. So in all my reference photos, there's all these sad dogs just <laughs> looking really disappointed in all my life choices. And either, either my husband gallops around in a weird outfit or my husband's taking pictures while I gallop around in a weird outfit. Right. And usually I'll take... I'll take dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of reference photos, like just from slightly different angles. Like, okay, I've got a hand in this position. Let's try it slightly different. Let's try it rotated slightly higher, slightly lower. I ideally, I want to progress to being able to set up a rig where I have the photo and I can just have that camera hooked up to a computer monitor and have a remote control in my hand and then yep. pose myself, look at the computer monitor, snap that photo. Uh, that's kind of my, my goal for uh, 2021 is to, finally invest in a 
a newer digital camera from <laughs> you know from from this millennia and <laughs> and actually be able to set it up like that so i can have even more control over my reference photos so the so the reference photos are obviously going to help you with uh structure right mm -hmm. they're going to help you with pose and things like that and hands. But, uh, hands oh god hands bless hands feet. hands yeah. and feet i was just yeah. about to say feet too All i still feet can't draw worst. feet i can't draw feet <laughs> Uh, I can barely draw hands. Um, but it sounds like it also, based on your comment about the Halloween shop, that you're also using it for uh, clothing and for material and, and things like that. Is that right? Yeah. And like sometimes I can fake hands. I Faking cloth is – usually you can tell if an artist tries to fake yeah. cloth. Like the, the folds just don't look realistic. And that's been something I've been noticing in my own work as I look at it and I'm like, you can tell I faked that. Like it doesn't yep. – that's something I need to improve. So I'm, I'm working on – working on building up my uh, my prop closet so I can really get those get those folds get those costumes right yeah and it's it's funny because you know again we get back to the technique conversation we had before with technique you can draw hair you can draw mm -hmm. hands with technique you can draw folds but it doesn't mean it's going to look right it yeah. doesn't mean it's going to fit what you're talking about so that makes total sense to me so now you are in a situation where you've got the sketch the black and mm -hmm. white um, it's, it's been approved and and now we're going to now we're going to work with light right now mm -hmm. we're going to add color and things like that um, what does that process look like for you and it's kind of interesting in that the process is almost the reverse of what it was when I was a student as a student I would rush through the client sketch and the reference process and be like okay just got to get it over with and then I'd spend the majority of the time on the final painting Right. Anymore, I found the majority of my time is on all that prep work is getting like my client sketches are there's not a ton of detail, but they're fairly tight and mm -hmm. it usually has value structure. So I'll be like, OK, the foreground is going to be dark, middle ground, oh, okay. medium, background's light. Um, and then with the reference that gives me all the folds, um, the the colors a lot of times I'll, I'll do a variation of whatever naturally the colors are. The sky will be some shade of green or blue mm -hmm. if it's, if it's daytime, things like that. Um, color is something I can probably improve on in the future, but a, a lot of, a lot of the painting is already decided. Like the painting is no longer the biggest part of the project for me. Like the right. biggest part of the project is all that sketch work, all the ideations. And by the time I get to the painting, it almost feels like a, the project's like 80% done. Like a lot of the problems have already been solved. Um, and it's just putting it down there onto, onto the canvas. And so it's actually one of the shorter parts of the process anymore. The longest part is in the, in the ideations. Something that I am realizing more and more, the more I, more I paint and be, and actively uh, produce something. Um, and I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this. I, I am realizing, and I'm, I, and to give you a, a background, I completely relate to everything you just said <laughs> because I, I feel like it's so much about choices and decisions, right? And like I, I will paint a model in my head 15, 20 times before I ever pull out a brush. Yeah. And it feels like sometimes when I'm painting a model that I'm just finishing it up. Like yeah, I've already, yeah. like I've, all the decisions have been made, all yeah. of the choices have been made. And, and I, and it sounds to me like that's a little bit what you're talking about here, that, that, that the heavy lifting's over and now you're, now you're doing what was almost already finished in your head. Does that sound? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times it is finished, not even just in your head, but on paper because you've been communicating it to the client. They have to, to know where you're going. So it, right. uh, like a good chunk of it is already on paper planned it just needs more details fleshed out and sometimes the colors are even decided as well if the client wants a uh, color comp you'll have already right. done a small little color color painting for them so they can see where it's going mm -hmm. and at that point it's just combining all the things together and rendering it out very, very cool. Very cool. Well, guys, we're going to take another break. When we get back from this break, I'm going to uh, dig into a little bit more with her work with Weird. So we're going to talk about some of the stuff that she's done. I want to find out some of her favorite uh, uh, stuff from Weird. We'll see if it matches up with my favorite work of hers or not. Um, but I also want to talk um, about kind of painting and uh, creating art uh, in that world itself. So we'll be right back. 
Howdy friends, Greg here. Nothing makes Malifaux easier than having the right tools. Here at the third floor, we love all the licensed Malifaux goodies from Custom Meeple. Not only are they helping support this podcast, they sell custom-made weird licensed tokens and terrain. They sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3x3 three three full Malifaux board. Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com, that's with one M, or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend, all one word, T H I R D F L O O R F R I E N D, you'll get a 5% discount and help support the podcast. It's valid on everything except retail products and playmats. There are so many online retailers. It can be hard to find one that is trustworthy, has great prices, along with some reliable customer service. On the third floor, we love ordering our gaming goodies from Gadzooks Gaming. Their selection of terrain, miniatures, dice, custom decor, and conversion bits are curated for gamers by gamers. You'll find they have what you need and what you didn't know you needed to take your gaming fun to the next level. If you mention Third Floor Wars in the cart notes of your order, you'll also get a free gift. And you'll help support the podcast. Check out gadzooksgaming.com and mention Third Floor Wars on checkout to get that free gift. I honestly think we could do four hours on the stuff you've made for weird. Um, it, um, like I mentioned, being a fanboy of yours, uh, it, it was one of those I'm things so where I was just like, I'm so glad you like my work, by the way. Oh, Thank you. I do. I really, really do. And it, it, um, it, it's one of those things. And this has happened to me with other artists where I, I like your work without realizing that I liked your work. So like I, I found myself gravitating to certain, certain art that weird was producing and it, turned out it was all yours um but um I, i'd be curious to know and i'm trying to figure out the best way to to delve into this because it's uh something you and i talked about during the break it's a little bit of a challenge to talk about this so let, let's do this is there something recently you've done for weird a project you've done for weird that we can use as kind of a basis for this conversation something that maybe um that you're particularly proud of or that was enjoyable ah oh, that's tricky um I hate it all. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot of the ones that you mentioned that are on my website, I had a lot of fun with. So the yeah. uh, the faction banners, the Molly crew, the uh, the the Vix, um, those those were all a lot of fun. Though I do want to mention if uh, I am definitely not the only artist working for weird. If you, if you have enjoyed my work, uh, or anyone listening to this, if if you've enjoyed my work, definitely check out Hardy Fowler and, uh, Sarah Lindstrom as well. I know they do very good. They do a, a lot of work and weird has a lot of really collaborative work where sometimes I would do the lines and someone else would do the color or someone oh, wow. else would do the lines and I would do the color. Uh, and I've, I haven't worked with any other companies that have done that, but in, in weird, in order to get the coloring consistent, quite a lot of times there's multiple artists involved in one piece. Interesting. I never, I don't think I ever would have thought that. So let's, let's do this. Let's talk about the, the Molly crew, which was, um, I can tell you as a consumer, when weird put that out the first time, it it took the fan base by storm. Like people oh, were like, that. <laughs> holy cow, this is incredible. Um, so um, where did, so I assume weird approaches you and says, we have an idea. Um, we want to do pirate Molly. Yep. Pretty much. And um, what's next at that point? Did you just say, you know, I've got some ideas or they've got ideas or like, I, I'm trying to understand how she comes to life. Uh, and when well, I say she, I mean the yeah, whole crew. Yeah. Um, usually when Nathan approached me with the idea, like as the art director, he already has ideas for a lot of the characters. So he'll say like, okay, and he'll include, he'll have a whole bunch of images attached of like, we have this direction in mind for such and such a character. We have this direction in mind for such and such a character. Uh, he might, for some of them, he might be like, don't know with this one. 
come up with something. Yeah. But but quite a lot of times I think I think art directors are kind of undervalued. A lot of the times when people are looking at the direction artists take, that direction was led by the art director. Right. Um and sometimes again, sometimes the artists are just given free reign, given like come up with something. Um mm -hmm. but a, a lot of times they're the art director works with the development team to come up with a plan and a direction. And then that entire plan and direction is presented to the artist. So what did Nathan present to you? With I'm, this? Trying, I'm trying to remember. Um, I, I remember that some characters were pretty fleshed out already. I remember Molly herself. He already had quite a few ideas for her. Uh -huh. um, I, I, quite a few of the characters already had ideas in mind. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Which ones? I'm trying to remember if there were ones. I know there were a couple ones that were more like, come up with an idea here. We want something that just fits. Right. I, I can't remember which ones they are. <laughs> I, I, for the life okay. of me, I cannot remember. <laughs> now, uh, how about the alternate rogue necromancy, the uh, the big hulking fish, uh, oh, the fish. guy? I love anglerfish. I'm so anglerfish, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to remember if... No, I feel like that one was a little more open ended. I'm trying to think back to my client sketches if if I threw him some sketches that were really off the ball for that. I I, I I'm not sure. I, I feel like I might have thrown him some really weird sketches and he was like, <laughs> Thanks for the ideas. How about you do a fish guy instead? Um and then it, that worked out. Because some, sometimes I'll come up with sketches and like in my head they look good and in hindsight and maybe two fresher eyes, maybe they, they weren't such a great idea. Um, Has this ever worked in reverse with weird? Has there ever been a situation where you had ideas and they either were put in front of weird and it led led to something um, or maybe uh, stuff that you were, thought you had and you just threw it over to Nathan's way? Yeah. Um, actually, one of the other ones I mentioned, the Easter Vix, mm -hmm. and actually the other Easter one, that Easter Bob Ross Gremlin. Oh, that's that, so good. The The Bob Ross Gremlin was one I finished my work early for the day, and so I was just sketching, and I have a little Funko Pop of Bob Ross that watches over me while I paint, and so I was I, I had done him up as as a gremlin, and Nathan's like, we can use that for something. And with the VIX, there had been an email out to the game designers, graphic designer, me, everyone involved saying, like, submit your ideas for the Easter thing. And I had suggested, what if we do the, the VIX, which are kind of kind of fan service-y, uh, do one, uh, announce, like, okay, we're going to do the VIX, like, in an Easter bunny costume, like, in a bunny outfit. It sounds, like, all sexy. And then release the picture of her, like, in the big frumpy bunny outfit. Like, looking, I love it. Looking, like, really upset. I just, I thought that would be so much fun. Um, and I, I'm really excited they actually let me do that. So what's it like? Um, you finish the art mm -hmm. and then it goes to somebody else to become yeah. a render. Um, is there is there communication between the two of you, the sculptor and you, or is, is it a handoff? Uh, when I was in-house at Weird, sometimes I would talk with the sculptor a little bit. Um, and a lot of times it was easier when I was in house because Nathan would communicate what needed to change and I would actually be able to like paint over on the sculpt. Like as he was talking, I could oh. be like, oh, do this and this and this. So we could just send a JPEG back to the sculptor. Got but it. now that I'm freelance, um, I, it's just a handoff. It is. Is it, um, is it weird? <laughs> wow. Weird. <laughs> is it strange? Is it strange to see your two dimensional work translate into a physical object? I'm pretty sure the first time I got to actually hold a sculpt of my painting, I like, I feel like my, my memory just blanked for the next hour. And I just like I sat bet. there and held it because it was such an incredible thing. Like, it's still so cool. But I think the coolest part, like seeing it in 3D is cool. The coolest part is seeing people paint with them and play with them. That, like, that is... I, I, I don't even have words for that. Um, yeah. a, a lot of times, like there was some study looking at like when paintings are in a museum, how long do people look at them? And it was like an average of like 10 seconds or 15 seconds or something is how long a person will look at a painting. And like, that's, that's, that's usually an artist, like you'll look at something and especially as an illustrator, you hope that, Oh, they'll, they'll buy it or, and, but that's still not a lot of interaction. You look at it, you like it, you, you, you buy it. 
but doing the miniatures art like actually seeing people paint my characters like combine like i was part of the art process and then they're yeah. making it part of their art process and they're making yeah. new art with it like oh my god when people made scenes like little dioramas with like a little character i designed was in the diorama like that that blew my mind that was to to be able to be a small part of someone else's art is God, i never would have thought of experience. that I, and, that has to be and to see people play with my art like to actually see people enjoying a game and being like oh i got to be a part of that it's it's really cool it's really fun and in its own way, I would imagine it's it's a culmination of us going back in time to the discussion we had of you saying, I want to I want to do art for tabletop gaming. Yeah. And and this is, you know, do you th when you go back and you made that decision, was this part of that decision is that you wanted your art to be used and, and, and done with? Or was it just that you were interested in the in the industry? I actually didn't know about miniatures games when I first wanted to go into tabletop art. Uh, my main my main influence was for one my husband was playing tabletop games but even before then I'd been buying this art annual called Spectrum and it's a bunch of illustrators submit their work to it every year and it's got a ton of incredible sci-fi fantasy fantastical surreal painting stuff and I always buy it every year and look through it and be inspired and intimidated and and like equal amounts yeah and like even in high school I I'd buy it and I'd look through it and I'd be like this Wizards of the Coast place hires a lot of really cool art. And I had no idea who they were. Like, I didn't even know they were d and I'm just like, they have the coolest paintings in the whole book. Like, I want to work for them someday. And like, I still haven't worked for them. But um, I wanted I wanted to do that sci-fi fantasy painting. And then when, you know, my hus I met my husband and saw he and his friends playing games and I got to pick up the books and flip through them. I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, yeah. I want to draw these cool, like that, that little like 12 year old in me who liked draw dragons in the corners of her math homework. Like I get to do that. Like I <laughs> wanted to do that still. That part of me never went away. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, Alyssa, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I really appreciate you um, taking the time um, for people that uh, want to see more of your work um, and uh, to kind of stay in touch with you and your career. Where should they go? Um, you can always check out my website, uh, www.alissamenold.com. My last name, Menold, is just like old men, but backwards. <laughs> um, you can also check me out on Twitter, which is just at Alyssa Menold. Fantastic. Well, uh, at some at some point, I'm going to have to figure out a reason to have you come back on because I've really enjoyed this. Um, it's awesome being on here talking to you. It's really enjoyable. Okay. Enjoyed. Thank you. And for those of you that stayed around to the end, thanks for listening. Take care. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch so you don't miss the avalanche of content we create. Links are in the show notes. Be sure to check out our shop on thirdfloorwars.com for the latest in gaming apparel and gear. There you'll also find the latest information for the U.S. Faux Tour. Find out where you rank in your conference or even in the entire United States. Get those models built, painted, and ready so we can see you at the next U.S. Faux Tour Masters event. Please take a moment to write a review of this pod on your favorite platform. Rating and reviewing helps us find more listeners almost as cool as you are. Be sure to share this feed with all of your friends who love tabletop gaming. Thanks for listening. Howdy folks, Craig here. Now, if you love gadgets as much as we do, you're going to love the new Third Floor Wars Gadget Bundle from Schooner Labs. Branded with the logo of your favorite podcast, it comes with two measuring multi-tools, a compass stepper for those tight and important movements, along with a compact dashboard to track your turn, strat, and scheme scoring, along with your soul stones and pass tokens. It is the perfect bundle for anyone who plays Malifaux or just wants to look cool while doing it. The link is in the show notes. Check them out and help support your favorite gaming podcast. Right. Um, so our last segment we've already done. <clears throat> we kind of rolled that in before, which is fine. So this will probably be our last segment. But okay. before before we decide that, is there anything that you want to talk about that you didn't see here or anything that in this conversation so far that you want to tease out? One thing I really wanted to talk about, I kind of shoehorned in there, was that that intro email to artists needs some more information. That's <laughs> such, it's such a uh, it's such a pet peeve. Um, 
of it, people it, doing it totally innocently. Like they're just right. Like they just don't. They just don't know. Yep. Yep. It's um. It's funny to me because I've commissioned artists, uh, so I do uh, RPG actual plays, mm -hmm. right? And I like to have um, characters mm -hmm. <clears throat> for the splash screens on the YouTube yeah. channel and thumbnails. And plus, I, I, you know, my, my players, it's fun yeah. for my players to have it. And um, just instinctively, I was very happy that I instinct, like you told me yeah. that I'm like, oh, I did good. <laughs> like I, I said the right things to the artist yeah. when I reached out. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's so nice. So then you have, you have the other person who, who emails you and they, they, they want their character done and you get like a, a 12 page description of like the characters, you know, favorite favorite music and the, you know. <laughs> and like I, I prefer I prefer to get too much information I've, I've had I've had a client send me um send me like poetry and YouTube videos of philosophy discussions oh, wow. <laughs> it's like cool like I, I'll, I'll take it I'll take it I'll take that more than no information but it is it is funny it is funny, but it also it's given me an opportunity because I've never done it before yeah. to get a get a cadence with an artist too. Mm -hmm. So I've used him several times now, yeah. and now he and I have built up a language, right? Yeah. Like I know exactly what to send him yeah. because I've we've learned how to talk to each other, you know. So I send him like I send him five pictures. Here's, yeah. here's what I want the pose to be. Here's I want him this jacket with this yeah. hair and <laughs> and no background and yeah. boom and like three days later because the guy's insane he sends it back to me and. We, we never have to do one more than one revision. It's amazing. Yeah. But um, it's, it's it's the same and vice versa, too. Like, I'll have a repertoire. Like, I'll communicate differently with different clients. Yeah. Because um, some I'll know, like, okay, I need more information from this client when they didn't give me that. Versus others, I'll be like, they didn't give me this information. They want me to invent my own. Yeah. And so you start to you start to learn which clients, uh, how different clients communicate. And That's it cool. is nice. It is nice to get the first project over with and start to build a repertoire. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yep. Very cool. All right. I'll bring us back. Okay. We'll figure out how I want to start it. All right. You are my first artist artist that I've had on the show. And cool. I was a little worried discussing visual art, <laughs> but it, this has been fantastic. Sweet. Um, so hat, hats off to you. I'm happy to hear that. Um, <laughs> it is, it is it's had, kind of weird talking about visual art without, like if you're doing a podcast, there's no visual medium. <laughs> Well, I've had people, I've had fans say to me, you know, Craig, we need to do uh, a show about painting and about the hobby. And I'm like, I don't know how to freaking do that. Yeah. You know, I can do a YouTube on it. I've got YouTube tutorials on how to paint and stuff, but I, I still haven't figured out how to crack that nut. Yeah. Um, on, on the podcast. I'll figure it out at some point. That's, that's my <laughs> Vietnam. I've got a terrible life. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right. I'll bring us back. All right, so obviously we have a terrible time talking with each other. That's going to be tough. <laughs> oh, that's fun. All right. Um, so take the idea of the water here. Yeah, take your time. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is, you know, basically first time, first time you drew something to, first time you got paid by, paid to do it, and All right. how you how you got to the chair you're sitting in right now, um, and then I want to kind of break into the misconceptions of being a person who does art for a living um and on top of it somebody who does it freelance which is has its own you know own uniqueness about yeah. it does that sound good yeah sounds great great all right i'll bring us back hey are you still here look uh the podcast is over and you sat through all of the breaks and bloopers well i mean if you're here might as well run over to patreon.com and become a supporter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast too while you're at it on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you sticking around. Take care.